Okay, let's get started. So if you had a look at that previous slide, you would have seen you need to be able to describe different legal terms with your legal terminology. So human rights is obviously one of the most important parts of this. It's the, the name of the whole topic. So this is something that you really need to know. So human rights are the fundamental rights that all people have by virtue of being human beings, regardless of race, gender, age, nationality, or religion. So defined as the supreme, inherent, and inalienable rights to life, to dignity, and to self-development. So think about um, not only just the general meaning of what that was saying, uh, but also the legal terminology that you have, you can see in there. So um, for example, you want to say fundamental rights. Um, you don't want to just say human rights are the rights uh, that all people have. Um, and by virtue of being human beings, um, things like the supreme, in inherent, and inalienable um, rights. So having all that legal terminology is definitely important um, to, to make it a bit more sophisticated. Um, and then human rights are defined internationally, nationally, and locally by various lawmaking bodies. So we'll see some examples um, throughout today's lecture. Um, of those bodies and you can also see on the slide just some examples of human rights that we do have and a lot of those I'm sure will um, resonate with you um, as human rights that you are pretty aware that we would have. States. So this is something that is going to come up all the time in, um, in this unit and it may have done already in legal studies. Um, so what you want to keep in mind is it's not like the state of Queensland, it's a country um, in, in the terms of human rights. So they're countries recognised as having legal standing under international law. And in order to have that legal standing, you need a defined territory. So you can see that defined territory of Australia with... Um, with where all our borders are, uh, one government, and we have that one government. Um, as we know, Anthony Albanese is our prime minister, and a permanent population. Um, definitely know that we have that since we are all here today. Um, and they do have the ability to enter into relationships recognized by law with other states, so other countries. And we'll see throughout today's lecture that um, that is definitely the case for Australia. Something else that you will see all the time um, throughout this unit is these terms that refer to our legally binding agreements between the states. So we've got convenants and treaties. And they are often used synonymously, so meaning the same thing. So binding agreements between states that are formal um, and they define and modify their mutual duties and obligations. So it's saying um, this is what we are signing up to, that we're promising uh, we're going to uphold in terms of different responsibilities that they would have. So down the bottom there, you can see that there's actually another one as well. So convention is also a legally binding agreement between states. So if we look in more depth at that now, um, so again, the same definition, um, but a little bit more information as well. Um, conventions are stronger than declarations because they are legally binding for governments that have signed them. So think about that word declaration. Um, if you declare something, um, meaning that you say it out loud um, or, or say it in writing, um, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to go through with it. Um, you could change your mind. 
So conventions are stronger because they are legally binding um, and it's um, it's a bit more serious, I suppose. So when the UN General Assembly adopts a convention, it creates international norms and standards. So back to that idea of the, the duties and the obligations. So what are the standards that every state, every country needs to meet? And once that convention is adopted, then the member states can ratify the convention and we'll have a look a bit more about what ratification means throughout today as well. Um, and then if you violate those um, standards in the convention, then you can get censured by the UN as well, which I'm sure we have seen um, before. Now, throughout today's lecture, I've got some practice questions that you'll be able to do um, if you pause the video, then you can have it go straight away. Um, if not, you can use it as a bit of a revision tool um, in your own time, um, just to be able to test yourself to see if you have a good understanding. Um, at the end of the lecture today, there is a slide that um, gives you either the answers or directs you to the slides where you can find the answers. So hopefully these practice questions will make this a bit more practical for you. Okay, so we've got different types of treaties. So we've got multilateral and bilateral. So hopefully we're familiar with those, um, the start, the terms, so multi and bi. So both of them are formal agreements entered into by our nation states so a nation state is just the same as a state um but they're basically just a different amount of states that are involved that's the difference between the two so by means two and multi um in general it means more than one but in this case it does mean more than two so more than two states are in that formal agreement um, for multilateral and bilateral is just the two. So as promised, we've got a bit more about ratification and signatories um, and the difference between the two as well. So when we have a signatory, that's a state that is in political support of a treaty and it's willing to continue that engagement with the treaty process. So it's sort of like, um, I guess, an expression of interest of sorts. You're saying that you're interested. You're saying that you're willing to continue um, that process of, of following along with it. But you haven't yet actually got that legislation that's making it um, legal so um, the, it's an intent, so that's important. It's about intent and it hasn't actually happened yet. So it's a sig signature that's submitted to the qualifying international body. So that's just meaning that whoever is in charge of that um, particular treaty, that is who you're submitting the signature to. Um, and so, again, that important detail of in a state that's a signatory to a treaty, the treaty has not entered into force, meaning it's not become, um, it's not been turned into legislation yet uh, for that particular state. Now, ratification, on the other hand, occurs when a signatory country implements legislation domestically. So it is the process of full adoption of the obligations imposed by a treaty or convenant into Australian law by passing legislation through the federal parliament that is mirroring, mirroring those treaty obligations. So whatever the treaty said um, that you needed to meet the different standards and obligations, you're passing legislation that reflects that in um, in that particular country. 
Um, a bit of an example as well. So Australia is a party to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, which was um, made in 1989. Um, and therefore, each state in, um, in Australia, so state meaning our normal sort of definition of state in this case, um, has legislation protecting children to uphold the principles of the convention. So in Queensland, the Child Protection Act 1999 is an example of a piece of legislation that was passed to ensure that um, that convention was ratified. So um, what we've got here is uh, different dates as well to keep in mind. So signing where you express the intention to comply with the treaty. So in the case of this convention on the rights of the child in Australia, that occurred on the 22nd of August, 1990. Um, and then domestic legislation was implemented um, in December of 1990. So you've got three different dates there. One when it was actually made, um, 1989. One when um, Australia signed to express their intention to comply, and then one where it was ratified with that domestic legislation. So that's the difference there. Um, signing hopefully is a pretty easy word to remember to understand that that means um, intention. Sovereignty, and this is quite um, this is quite relevant with the referendum that we'll be having um, later this year in Australia. So sovereignty is the concept that a government exercises full control over the affairs within a geographical or territorial limit. So, um, for example, just um, the country of Australia. That's um, that's that geographical or territorial limit of, of what constitutes Australia. So that, um, that government can pass laws and enforce them within that area, um, like the government does in Australia, um, and it exists as an independent legal and political body. So it's not going to be influenced by um, someone else that's in charge. We are in charge here of our own, um, our own laws. So we can see their um, sovereignty with our First Nations flag. So um, Australia claims sovereignty, as um, we just said, over the territory and the people. But um, also some First Nations Australians um, say that they never relinquished their sovereignty. So we do have that debate um, because of the history of Australia with, uh, with what happened with our First Nations people. So that relates to, to sovereignty and who actually has that control over, over the land and, and the laws and what happens here. Bilateral and multilateral. So those two we spoke about earlier and you've got a few options about what they actually refer to. So have a go at that when you can. Okay, Bill of Rights and Royal Commission. Um, hopefully these terms are maybe slightly familiar to you after um, the time that you've had in legal studies so far. So a Bill of Rights is a formal declaration of the legal and civil rights of the citizens of any state, country, or federation. So um, it exists to protect those rights of individuals from being violated by the state or other individuals. So it's saying this is what you your rights are and um, and because that's written down in this formal declaration that helps to protect you um, as well. So, so if you're not getting those, those rights, then 
um, then something can potentially be done about that. Our Royal Commissions, so again, hopefully you've heard about these as well in the media. So the Australian system of government has Royal Commissions that are that highest form of inquiry. So it's independent of government and they investigate matters of public importance. So we've had Royal Commissions into banks, we've had Royal Commissions into um, aged care, um, all those sorts of important matters that required investigation, those are the Royal Commissions. So Royal Commissions have those broad powers to hold public hearings, um, call witnesses under oath and compel evidence. So that just means they have broad powers to, um, to seek and, um, and gain a lot of evidence from a lot of different people um, to inform that investigation. Um, and once they have done all of that research, they make recommendations to government about what should change as well. 